One of the most underrated edges in fantasy football is coaching changes, understanding how scheme and coaching changes are going to affect our fantasy football players and the offenses that we're targeting is a big time differentiator between true ball knowers and guys that are just kind of casual fantasy football players. So today we're going to dive into every major coaching change around the NFL. Now that the dust has settled on some of these guys, we can see what their moves were, how they drafted, some of the free agents that they brought in. Heading into training camp, this could be a big time indicator of what players are going to rise up boards in uh, drafts come late August, early September when we're drafting our fantasy football leagues. And that, of course, can give you an underdog draft edge in best ball right now or just get ahead of your league mates when it comes to season-long fantasy drafts. So going to be a fun video. If you guys get some value from this, leave a like down below. Subscribe to the channel if you are new around here. I'm going to post this as an article over on the site, flockfantasy.com, promo code FSE for seven days for free. Link will be down below in the pinned comment and in the description for that. But with that being said, let's get right into it. Okay, so before we get into this video, shout out to Scott Barrett from Fantasy Points. Actually wrote an article on the major coaching changes, and I thought it was a really interesting topic. So I did kind of use that as inspiration for this video and actually took some of the metrics from his article. So definitely go check that article out. I believe it's a free read over on FantasyPoints.com, but they have a ton of other great content as well. Not a sponsor, just plugging good work and kind of the inspiration for this video. With each one of these teams, I'm going to go through the head coaching changes first, and then just the offensive coordinator changes second. With each one of these coaching changes, I'm going to talk about kind of who's in and who's out as far as the coordinator positions, the play callers and all that stuff. Then I'll kind of talk about the coaching and uh, background and the tendencies of the coach that's coming in and who's most affected kind of fantasy wise. Is it like a stock up situation, a stock down situation, kind of more of the same that we're kind of expecting. So let's start with the head coaching situations that change throughout the league. And I ranked them from most likely to improve the offense to least likely to improve the offense. So the guys that we're going to talk about first are going to be players that I'm mostly excited about um, going into 2024 fantasy football draft. So let's start in Atlanta where Raheem Morris comes in as the head coach. Of course, he's a defensive guy. Zach Robinson as the offensive coordinator is the one that we're kind of concerned with right now, replacing Arthur Smith, who made every fantasy manager who owned an Atlanta Falcons player's lives hell with whether it was Drake London or Kyle Pitts or Bijan Robinson. We all hated Arthur Smith as an offensive coordinator and a play caller. Zach Robinson comes from the Sean McVay coaching tree, comes from the Los Angeles Rams. Uh, serving as OC there for the last two seasons. However, he was not calling plays in Los Angeles. Uh, uh, Sean McVay, of course, is the play caller there. The Rams, though, were a top 10 offense in EPA last year, points per game, and total yardage. So they were a good team. They actually overperformed expectations, kind of what we thought of them going into the season. The 2023 Atlanta Falcons ranked dead last in pass rate over expected. We all knew this. Arthur Smith wanted to run, run, and run some more. The Rams, where Zach Robinson came from, ranked 11th in pass rate over expected. So we're kind of expecting a jump up in terms of overall passing volume for this offense, especially coupled with the fact that they signed Kirk Cousins in free agency. They also drafted Michael Penix in the top 10. Coming in at quarterback, the, the big catalyst for this offense and the optimism is just the quarterback play. But I would argue that the offensive scheme change to Zach Robinson is just as big for the fantasy values of Drake London, of Kyle Pitts, of Bijan Robinson, of Darnell Mooney, and all the other surrounding pieces there. The biggest beneficiary of this new offensive scheme change, in my opinion will undoubtedly be Bijan Robinson number one because Arthur Smith isn't there to troll him and give him you know no carries inside the red zone and take him off the field for Tyler Algier but number two because Sean McVay coaches and Zach Robinson obviously coming from that tree notoriously do use one running back they're using feature backs on all three downs and in the red zone and they give their running backs the ball in the red zone quite a bit as well so for me I look at Bijan Robinson as a guy that could go absolutely nuclear this year I don't think I'm breaking any news here but I don't really know if everybody understands just how bonkers B. John Robinson could go this year. He could have a 24, 25 fantasy point per game type of season, catch 100 passes, and also rush for 20 plus touchdowns because A, he's that talented. B, this offense is going to be a lot better. And C, he could be an absolute workhorse in this offense. Perhaps we see enough volume in the passing game that Drake London takes a big step. That's where he's kind of being drafted and projected as such. Kyle Pitts finally becomes a stud tight end 
And hell, even maybe Darnell Mooney makes for a great late round sleeper because he's had a top 30 season in points per game in Chicago. And the last two years in Chicago, they just haven't had any pass volume either. And he's coming into a situation where most of the time we see a lot of these Rams receivers have multiple great seasons. It's not just one guy there. Like we saw both Puka Nakua and Cooper Cup. We saw it last year and years past. It was Brandon Cooks and Robert Woods and Cooper Cup all getting there. So when it comes to like the stock up, stock down of this Falcons offense, I mean, nuclear stock goes to to be John Robinson. I think he could absolutely break fantasy football this year. And then, of course, stock up to Kyle Pitts, stock up to Drake London, stock up to Kirk Cousins, stock up to Darnell Mooney, and then maybe some stock down on Tyler Algier because his standalone role won't probably be very solid this year. But if Bijan gets injured, of course, he would have a big role as the handcuff there. So moving over to Tennessee, where Mike Vrabel is out, Brian Callahan comes in as the head coach and Brian Callahan replaces Tim Kelly as the offensive coordinator there as well. He comes from the Sean McVay coaching tree as well via Zach Taylor in Cincinnati. So he was with the Bengals before as their offensive coordinator comes over and head coaches the Tennessee Titans. The Bengals were second in neutral uh, script pass rate last year in 2023 without Joe Burrow for most of the year. So this is a team that wanted to pass the ball. This is a coach that wanted to pass the ball. That should really speak to the philosophy that they have going into Tennessee. This won't be your Mike Vrabel Titans. I I feel very confident saying that after the moves they've made this offseason and this new coaching change, they're committing to Will Levis throwing the ball this year. And he's a big armed quarterback. They sign Calvin Ridley to big money. They add Tyler Boyd to play the slot in free agency as well. This scheme lives in 11 personnel, three wide receiver sets, as we know from Sean McVay. And I think knowing that they beefed up the offensive line, they signed three guys in free agency, including center Lloyd Cushenberry to a big extension. And they also drafted JC Latham in the top 10 of the NFL draft as well. Plus, Brian Callahan brings in his father, Bill Callahan, who's one of the best offensive line coaches in the NFL. So I think every move that the Tennessee Titans have made this offseason points to the fact that they want to throw the football. The beneficiary of this offense being more pass heavy, of course, will be Will Levis, who could throw the ball 600 plus times this year. But the one that I've actually been playing this offense passing the ball through most often has been DeAndre Hopkins. I think DeAndre Hopkins actually looked pretty good last year, had a couple big games and showed a connection with Will Levis at quarterback. Calvin Ridley is actually the one being drafted higher and I was super big on Calvin Ridley last offseason but I am a little bit concerned that he's not quite the receiver that we thought he was going to be in Jacksonville I think he's still a fine pick he should walk into some volume as well but DeAndre Hopkins going cheaper of the two of them is the one that I've been heavily targeting I mean Tajay Spears and Tony Pollard are both interesting stabs at running back I prefer Spears at cost because he's the cheaper option and also the better pass catcher in hell maybe Chigakonkwo is kind of like a post type sleeper at tight end because I mean, I look at this offense, if they throw the ball 625, 650 times, it's not just going to be Calvin Ridley and maybe even DeAndre Hopkins getting there. It could be the running backs getting there in the passing game. It could be even a Chigokonkwo or a Tyler Boyd being a solid flex option, solid tight end option there. So I feel very confident that it's stock up on this passing game. Will Levis, DeAndre Hopkins, Calvin Ridley, uh, Tajay Spears, and then kind of like a stock neutral, I guess, on Tony Pollard and uh, Chigokonkwo and those type of guys. But I actually feel quite good about the Titans this year as a value offense where you don't have to pay a big time price tag for these guys and they could return quite a bit of value there. So moving over to the Seattle Seahawks where uh, Pete Carroll is gone. Mike McDonald coming over as head coach from the Baltimore Ravens. He was the defensive coordinator there last year. And Ryan Grubb coming in as the offensive coordinator. He was the offensive coordinator at the University of Washington in 2023, where he orchestrated the Huskies all the way to the national championship, where they eventually lost to the Michigan Wolverines. Uh, Ryan Grubb's offense is very aggressive. If you guys don't know anything about Ryan Grubb, his offense pushes the ball downfield. Michael Penix Jr. was the quarterback of that offense. He led college football with 117 deep targets in 2023. So it is very easy to just kind of pencil in the roles here and be lazy and be like, hey, DK Metcalf's going to be the Romo Dunze, JSN is going to be the Jalen McMillan and Tyler Lockett, I guess, paroles the middle of the field as the Jalen Polk. But perhaps it might be a little bit more complex than that because Geno Smith has not really been that aggressive so far in his Seattle Seahawks career, but he did have the sixth highest passing grade on throws of 20 plus yards. So maybe he should be more aggressive because he only threw the ball 18th most down the field, which could drastically change in this offense. So Geno Smith is a guy that I've been tacking on to a lot of my stacks of JSN and Tyler Lockett or DK Metcalf and JSN this year. I wouldn't 
I didn't expect really to be high on the Seahawks offense, but I do like what this new scheme could do for them. Grubb has also been more vocal about using the running backs in the passing game. Now, I don't know how that's going to affect the backfield because Zach Charbonnet, in my opinion, is the better receiver, but Kenneth Walker is the lead back there. So I've been kind of avoiding Walker and taking Charbonnet. The tight end position is also interesting because Noah Fant is, has been talked up by this coaching staff saying that he's going to be the seam buster, the guy that's going to create the big plays downfield with a two-year, $21 million extension and Will Disley and Colby Parkinson now gone in Seattle. Maybe Noah Fant represents a really good value at that position. I think all in all in this offense, I've been just targeting the pass game weapons specifically. And with Geno Smith, with DK Metcalf, with JSN, with Tyler Lockett, and with Noah Fant, I can really make the argument that all of these guys could achieve a better you know result than where they're currently being drafted. So for me, it's stock up on this pass passing game, potentially stock neutral or even stock down on Kenneth Walker and even Tyler Lockett too, because I think J, uh, JSN was grossly misused last year and has a chance to be used a lot more um, in three wide receiver sets this year. And I've been drafting him a ton over on underdog fantasy. So Moving over to the Carolina Panthers, who hire my former Buccaneers offensive coordinator, Dave Canales, as their head coach. And of course, he is going to call plays there, replacing Thomas Brown as the former play caller there in Carolina. This one I'm obviously very familiar with because I watched this offense all of last year as a Bucs fan. Dave Canales comes in fresh off of reviving Geno Smith's career and Baker Mayfield's careers in back-to-back seasons. Of course, he is looking for a three-peat, trying to revive Bryce Young's young career so far. In 2023, the Bucs were a top 12 team in pass rate and ranked about league average in pace of play. So we're talking about generally a pass-heavy offense. Canales deployed a workhorse running back in Rashad White, who received a top four snap share among all running backs and weighted opportunity share among all running backs. So, I mean, you look at what this could do for Jonathan Brooks and potentially Chuba Hubbard in the short term if Jonathan Brooks isn't healthy to start the year. The running game is something that I'm very interested in with this Carolina Panthers backfield because I do think Bryce Young is the type of quarterback that would want to check the ball down quite often. Once Jonathan Brooks is healthy, I think he's a great receiver. So Brooks is a guy that, especially in home redraft leagues, you can get him round eight, round nine, round 10 as an upside RB3 to build out um, for your running back core. He is a guy that I've been drafting a decent amount of. Same goes for on underdog as well. When it comes to the wide receiver position, I think it's a little bit more up in the air what I'm expecting. He's discussed playing to his player strengths. Uh, Dave Canales has talked about, oh, Xavier Leggett doesn't run a full route tree yet. So we're going to get him the ball, have him run kind of a reduced route tree so that we can get the ball in his hands. He did an excellent job with Mike Evans last year, but I think he kind of did a poor job with Chris Godwin. So it's a little bit of a mixed bag at the wide receiver position. I'd say I'm optimistic, generally speaking, about the Carolina Panthers, and I think that they'll look better on offense, but I'm confident also saying that they might start slow, and they might take a couple weeks before they get up to speed with all of these new moving parts, new running game, new offensive line pieces that they signed, new wide receivers that they brought in. It's going to take some time, new coaching staff, of course, and new scheme to gel in this offense. So for me, with the Carolina Panthers, I'm more of like a, I'll take them when they fall to me at ADP, but I'm not aggressively targeting any one guy guy in this offense sleeper tight end option there as well with Jatavian Sanders who I think is an interesting sleeper too Dave Canales had uh, Cade Otten of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers run 100% of the team's routes in 2023 which was the most among all tight ends so it's clear to me that he wants to use a workhorse tight end as well as a workhorse running back and Tommy Tremble and Ian Thomas aren't really anything at the tight end position so Jatavian Sanders could be the type of guy that you want to get ahead of the training camp buzz of the drum beat in preseason because I could see him being the type of guy that we look at his preseason usage and he's the starting tight end for this team and suddenly he's picked in the 130s of underdog drafts instead of in the late 200s where he's being picked right now. So he's the type of guy I would love to get ahead of on ADP. Um, so for me, just in general on this offense, I think it's stock up on the running backs, stock up on the tight ends, and we'll kind of wait and see what happens with Bryce Young and the wide receiver core because I've kind of long been skeptical of Dave Canal Alice just being a, a good play caller in general, but I do like what he does for the running back in the tight end position using one guy. That, of course, is very conducive to fantasy production. Moving over to the New England Patriots, who obviously have Bill Belichick out at head coach. Gerard Mayo was kind of promoted from within at head coach, and Alex Van Pelt comes in as the offensive coordinator, replacing Bill O'Brien. Uh, Van Pelt comes from Kevin Stefanski's Browns, where we know they've been a very run-heavy team but he didn't actually call plays in Cleveland. So we don't have a whole lot to take away, a whole lot of data to go off of with Alex Van Pelt as a play caller. 
The passing game takeaways aren't really substantial either. I think one thing that I'm interested in is that this offense could actually start a little faster than people think because if you guys recall, Jacoby Brissett was the starter in Cleveland for uh, about you know 10 games or whatever when Watson was suspended, and he had his best performance probably of his career in that stretch with the Browns. So if Jacoby Brissett wins this starting job, which I think probably is going to be the case, they want to sit Drake May by the sounds of it, he knows this system, and he might get these young wide receivers, Jalen Paul, Hulk, Javon Baker, uh, Demario Douglas, these type of guys off and running at the beginning of the season so that when Drake May takes over, it's not like you have to completely teach these guys how to play wide receiver. They had a veteran quarterback showing them the ropes to start. And then once May gets in there, hopefully they've already established themselves as a solid wide receiver core. This quarterback scheme is very friendly too. So once Drake May gets in there, I do think he'll have some success, whether it's, you know, running the ball and also kind of throwing over the middle to guys like Jalen Polk. He has been the one that I've heavily targeted the most because I think he's obviously the most investment with the highest draft capital. And also I think he just fits Drake May's skill set really well and fits this offense really well. So Jalen Polk to me is the guy that I have taken away as the best value. But DeMar Douglas, Javon Baker, hell, if you want to take shots on Kendrick Bourne or KJ Osborne late in best ball drafts, I wouldn't blame you too much. Hunter Henry at tight end, I think is an interesting option. The run game is also, I think, where the impact could be felt in this offense, where the Browns running backs, I mean, even without Nick Chubb last year, they were sixth in points per game among all running back cores around the league. So without Nick Chubb, they were still a very, very good running game, still a very good run scheme. I think that is great news for uh, Ramondre Stevenson, who obviously just got a big time extension a few weeks ago, and also good news for Gibson if Stevenson were to get injured. So you got a defensive head coach coming in and an offensive coordinator who comes from the run heavy Browns. I think this team will be very much a we want to run the ball, give the ball to Stevenson in the red zone, and that's why I've been heavily targeting him. And also, just from the passing game standpoint, probably not a super high volume passing game, but one that I think could be really efficient and underratedly efficient early in the year. So for me, stock up on the run game, stock up even on the quarterback play as well. Neutral kind of on the wide receiver core, because on one end, I think they could start fast, but on the other end, it might not be a very high volume situation. Like I said, Stevenson and Polk, the two most expensive options in this offense, to me are the guys that are the best targets. But I also don't mind Douglas, Henry, Gibson, Drake May, those type of guys that are going later on in drafts right now. So final uh, or second last head coaching hire of the video so far, we have the Washington Commanders, who, of course, fire Ron Rivera and hired Dan Quinn as their head coach and the offensive coordinator who's coming in to call plays is Cliff Kingsbury who if you guys recall was formerly the head coach of the Arizona Cardinals for a number of years there with Kyler Murray so a lot of changes in Washington Eric Bieniemy had this offense throwing at the highest rate in the NFL last year with Sam Howell and Jacoby Brissett but they were a very slow paced offense they weren't very efficient Cliff Kingsbury comes in he wasn't a great head coach and honestly he wasn't very good as an offensive coordinator at USC last year with Caleb Williams either, but he did have the Cardinals operating at the highest pace of play in the NFL during his tenure, the highest no huddle rate in the NFL during his tenure, top five in dropbacks per game and overall offensive play. So maybe Cliff Kingsbury has some warts as a play caller and a head coach, but he does have volume on his side. And one thing is for sure, Jaden Daniels has a chance to sleepwalk into top 10 quarterback uh, fantasy numbers this year because we know he's going to run. Kyler Murray averaged over eight rushing attempts per game under Cliff Kingsbury. And even though I'm not the biggest fit uh, or fan of his fit in this offense behind that offensive line as a passer in general, I think it's just a solid situation for the fantasy production is better than the NFL production. Specifically, I think this offense is going to be a three wide receiver set offense. Kling, uh, Cliff Kingsbury has had three wide receivers clear 75% of his routes in his entire tenure uh, uh, with the Cardinals. So Luke McCaffrey may be a good uh, late round sleeper as the starting slot receiver there, and he should get a lot of run early on with a connection to his rookie quarterback. Terry McLaurin and Jahan Dotson just were bad last year. I don't, I don't really know how to else to explain it. They were not as good as they should have been given the volume that they had. And honestly, Maybe Jaden Daniels just galvanizes this offense in a way that Sam Howell didn't. But regardless, I'm kind of skeptical of Terry McLaurin's ADP right now that it should be that much higher than everybody else in this wide receiver core. I get he's the best guy. He's the number one dude. But a 48th overall ADP on underdog is just simply a little high, in my opinion. In home leagues, he'll probably be more of like a fifth, sixth rounder as opposed to like a fourth rounder. But to me, I would rather take shots on Dotson and McCaffrey late than I would pay up for the expensive piece in McLaurin. To me, Daniels is the guy that 
that I want of all of these dudes, though. He's the one that I think all the fantasy production will funnel through. And the tight end position is kind of a bit of a wasteland right now because Zach Ertz, while he's old, was actually really good when he was on Arizona. He had a 7.5 targets per game under Cliff Kingsbury. Um, and But they also have second round rookie Ben Sinnott, who people are excited about. He was a prospect that I really liked. Snap shares in preseason will be crucial for this tight end position. If Ertz is a viable late rounder, we'll see it in preseason games. If Sinnott is a big breakout candidate, we'll see it in preseason games. For now, I'm not really touching the tight end position because I think um, there's a little bit more risk than I'm willing to invest in. Stock up, though, on Jaden Daniels for sure. I think stock up on Luke McCaffrey. I didn't mention the backfield, but if they're going to pass the ball, if they're going to run up-tempo, then Austin Eckler might have a bounce-back season and catch some passes this year. And same goes for Brian Robinson as a guy that if they're running up-tempo and scoring points, he could punch in some touchdowns. For me, I think I like Eckler because he's the cheapest, um, but I also don't mind Brian Robinson either, as I talked about in the Dynasty Trade Targets video. Um, I think it's kind of stock neutral on the rest of the offense, though. So moving into the final head coaching change, and then I'll kind of just rattle off the offensive coordinator stuff we have is the Los Angeles Chargers who fire Brandon Staley and they bring in Jim Harbaugh as the head coach. Greg Roman comes in as the offensive coordinator, replacing Kellen Moore. Those two could not be more opposite. Kellen Moore's offenses are very pass heavy. Greg Roman's offense was previously with the Ravens from 2019 to 2022 orchestrating the most run-heavy approach in the NFL over that span. With head coach Jim Harbaugh coming in and Greg Roman coming in, we can feel pretty confident knowing that they literally passed on Malik Neighbors and Romo Dunze at fifth overall in the NFL draft for a right tackle, that this team is running the football. We all know it's coming. It's baked into their price tags right now. It is very clear that they want to establish the run. The Chargers since 2022 have been the fastest paced and third most pass heavy offense in neutral game scripts. So this is a vastly stark difference we're talking about in what they're going to look like, which is uh, before what they used to look like. The Ravens in Roman's tenure ranked dead last in both pace of play and pass rate in neutral situations. So, I mean, obviously there's a bit of context there because Justin Herbert and Lamar Jackson are different types of quarterbacks, but I expect this offense to still shave off 100 to 125 pass attempts from the 632 that they had last year pretty easily. I think they're going to be at least bottom five in the NFL, if not dead last in the NFL in overall pass attempts this season. Herbert, when you think about it, should have been much better in those situations as a fantasy quarterback. Sub 20 points per game in two straight seasons now. He was QB 8 last year, but we had so many QB injuries, he wasn't even that much of a difference maker. And he had better weapons. He had Keenan Allen. He had Mike uh, Williams for a lot of that. He had Austin Eckler and more volume. I'm actively avoiding Justin Herbert in, in drafts right now because in redraft leagues, I think his name value will um, you know, kind of push him up the board a little bit too much. I suppose he's fine in best ball where he's going right now, but only when I'm stacking up Chargers players do I actually want Justin Herbert because I, I really don't think he has that high of a ceiling this year because of how much they're going to run the football. Where the value in this offense comes for me is the backfield because we don't know who the starter is going to be right now. Gus Edwards is the most expensive, but Kamani Vidal, the sixth round rookie from Troy and JK Dobbins, who you guys know I've been super high on for years, is also still there. The question is, is this going to be a three-way timeshare all season long where all these guys are just better and best ball type of dudes? Or is one of these guys going to emerge, whether it's the beginning of the year or the middle of the year, or the end of the year? I have long been a J.K. Dobbins stan. I think he is easily, when healthy, the most talented running back in this backfield. If he can rebound this year, and he is on track to be healthy for training camp, according to multiple reports, he would be my pick, because he's also the cheapest, to lead this backfield and be the guy that I draft the most. And he absolutely has been the guy that I've drafted the most on underdog. However... All of Gus Edwards at ADP 121, Kamani Vidal at ADP 155, and J.K. Dobbins at ADP 180 are good values. I'm fine taking a shot on any which guy that you like. I've mixed in J.K. Dobbins to some builds. I've mixed in Gus Edwards to some builds. And I've mixed in Kamani Vidal to some builds. Take shots on this backfield late in your drafts. Second round rookie um, wide receiver Lad McConkey is also an interesting piece as well. Josh Palmer. Both of these guys have a chance to have like 100 plus targets on the year with Keenan Allen and Mike Williams gone from this offense, but the ADP market is heavily pricing in that this is going to be one of the most run heavy offenses in the league. So for me, I think McConkey is the guy like shoot for the nuts, shoot for the high end rookie who could be far and away the best receiver in this receiving core. But I also in builds on underdog when I need wide receiver help, Josh Palmer is not a terrible guy to tack on because he's surprisingly been half decent at commanding targets, especially when Mike Williams or Keenan Allen has been out of the lineup. And of course, they're both gone now. So McConkey and Palmer are the passing game options 
options that I'm kind of interested in. And then specifically J.K. Dobbins, but also Edwards and Kamani Vidal in the run game. So it's definitely stock up on the run game, probably stock down on Justin Herbert the most, but also the passing game in general. So moving away from the overall head coaching changes, let's just get into the teams that uh, changed up their offensive coordinators. And I would say, generally speaking, when a head coach has changed, there's more turnover. There's more change that's going to happen in the offensive philosophy. Think about what I talked about with the Titans already. They went from one of the most run-heavy teams in the league, and they're probably going to be one of the most pass-heavy teams in the league now, and inverted uh, the Chargers as well. This offensive coordinator changes usually result in more uh, marginal changes. You're probably not going to see a vast difference between stuff. But I will say one of the changes that has a chance to really be big is is the Philadelphia Eagles going from Brian Johnson at offensive coordinator to Kellen Moore. As I alluded to with the Chargers, Kellen Moore has been the architect of many very pass-heavy offenses, including the Chargers last year, who, like I said, had 632 pass attempts, and also many years before that in Dallas, where his offenses have been good. I mean, he's had four top five offenses in the last five years, but they've also just been really pass-heavy, and that's kind of partially why they score points and partially why they rack up yardage. Regardless, I mean, the Eagles are very talented on on offense. They have a franchise quarterback and a bunch of great receivers. In Nick Sirianni's tenure, they're sixth last in neutral pass rate. So there is a lot of meat left on the bone for this offense to be much more pass heavy than they've been. Kellen Moore is likely going to boost those numbers and make more volume available for A.J. Brown and Devontae Smith and Jalen Hurts and uh, Dallas Goddard and Saquon Barkley out of the backfield. I am very much in on this Eagles offense as a bounce back unit. Generally speaking, I'm more in on the wide receivers and tight ends, but I do really like Saquon Barkley as well. So, I mean, I look at this offense and I have a lot of AJ Brown. I have a lot of Saquon Barkley. I have a lot of Devontae Smith. I have a lot of Jalen Hurts and I have a lot of Dallas Goddard. I like everybody in this offense right now. Because I do think that Kellen Moore, while he has flaws as a play caller, is going to increase the pace and increase the pass attempts here. And that's good news for everybody involved. It's good news for the quarterback, even though he runs. It's good news for the running game because they'll be in the red zone more often. And especially, it is good news for the ceilings of A.J. Brown, Devontae Smith, and Dallas Goddard as the pass catchers there. So moving over to New Orleans, where Clint Kubiak comes in as the offensive coordinator and play caller, replacing Pete Carmichael. And I think this offense was in the stone age last year, it looked like it was one of the most unwatchable units in the league. Surprisingly, they ranked about league average or better in pace of play and pass rate in 2023. Clint Kubiak has kind of been in the same vein as that McVay Shanahan kind of scheme working closely with Kevin Stefanski in Minnesota in uh, previous years before going to Denver in 2022. The efficiency of this offense is the thing that needs improvement in New Orleans. Derek Carr had one of his worst seasons of his career. Chris Olave can't find the end zone, even though he's a really talented player. If the efficiency uh, floor gets raised by Clint Kubiak, that could be huge for the New Orleans Saints fantasy options. Olave is the only option that I'm specifically in on at ADP. Even though he's going really high on underdog, I think you can actually get him a little bit later in home league drafts, kind of at that 2-3 turn area. Um, I just feel good that he is a volume commander. He's going to be a 25, 30% target share guy. And if this offensive efficiency goes up and Derek Carr has a better year, then Chris Olave could really, really have a monster breakout campaign. Derek Carr and Rashid Shahid are, are not guys that I find myself targeting very often, but I don't hate their value currently at ADP right now. The offense of pieces that I really kind of am worried about is Alvin Kamara because Alvin Kamara not only is super old and has Kendra Miller breathing down his neck, he also had so many checkdowns last year that if this offense is not operating in that way, then Alvin Kamara probably is a lot worse for fantasy than he is in years past. And if they're trying to operate an efficient rushing attack, Kendra Miller actually fits that better than Kamara does at this point in his career. So for me, I'm a little worried about this backfield. I don't know what to expect. On underdog, I'm okay taking Alvin Kamara because he goes late enough that it's baked in. But in home leagues, I feel like Kamara's ADP will be pushed up because of name value. He'll be like a fourth or a fifth rounder. And at that point, I would probably be out and I would just take Kendra Miller later on. But for me, the passing game is the part that I'm kind of interested in. Uh, Chris Olave and Rashid Shahid um, on underdog are really expensive and you got to pay up for them. But in home leagues, I feel like I'm going to be really, really in on those type of guys. So stock up on the passing game, stock down probably on Alvin Kamara at this point in time. Tampa Bay Buccaneers staying in the NFC South, obviously my favorite team. Liam Cohen replaces Dave Canales as the offensive coordinator. Liam Cohen comes from the Sean McVay coaching tree. He was the offensive coordinator in 2022 in Los Angeles where they kind of throw the ball like crazy. As I've already talked about, Baker Mayfield is familiar playing in this system because he was with the Rams for a short period of time 
with um, uh, Liam Cohen and Sean McVay back in 2022. The verbiage and all the other nuances of the offense should be a short adjustment period because it is very similar to Dave Canales' offense from that perspective. The main focus that I've heard Liam Cohen talk about numerous times, and obviously I follow this team more so than any other team in the league because I watch all the press conferences, I listen to everything that they're saying, and all they talk about is improving the running game. All they talk about. They add offensive line additions galore in free agency, and they drafted the best interior guy in the draft with Graham Barton to play center. This should all help Rashad White be a better running back because we know that Rashad White's a great receiving back, and many people, you can't open Twitter without people talking about Rashad White's terrible yards per carry, terrible rush yards over expectation. White's one of those guys that the Sharps hate because the advanced metrics say that he's not a very good running back and they let him fall to round six, round seven of underdog drafts. But I'm telling you right now, sometimes you have to take a step outside of the metrics and look at the scheme and watch how Rashad White was running last year. He runs patiently. He needs a good offensive line. He needs a good rushing scheme. And I believe that Liam Cohen will really help that out. And he should still get a lot of targets. He should still be the lead back here. I get Bucky Irving was drafted, but he's undersized. He's not that good. He is unathletic. Like I'm not exactly sure why everybody but he's so trendy with the Rashad White sucks and Bucky Irving is the guy take. But I'm telling you right now, nothing they've said this offseason indicate to me that White is in trouble of losing his job. He might lose some of his touches, but I don't think he's going to lose his job altogether. And White's also one of these guys that in casual home leagues, people will see that he finished as a top 10 running back last year and be super excited to draft him round three and round four. And obviously, I'm not drafting him that high. But on underdog, he's like a sixth round pick. And I'm absolutely going to draft him at that point in time. So depending on price, he's either a fade or a value. It really is going to be a stark difference in the platforms that you're using and the sharpness of the league that you're in. The other nugget that we've heard about this offense is that Chris Godwin's going to move back into the slot, which is great news for him because he is much better in the slot and it actually could hurt Mike Evans a little bit because Chris Godwin has averaged 2.11 yards per outrun in the slot last year versus 1.65 out wide at wide receiver. So Godwin is also one of those guys that I feel really confident is a stock up, probably the only like true stock up of this offense stock neutral, probably for the rest of the guys, Mike Evans, Rashad white, Baker Mayfield, Kate Otten might be a stock down potentially because as I mentioned with Canales and the Panthers, Kate Otten was like easily the only tight end we use last year and it's possible that Liam Cohen doesn't have that philosophy it's just a risk to him but again this offense relatively I would say should be more of the same in 2024 that it was in 2023 potentially a little bit better with some continuity there at quarterback Uh, Buffalo Bills Joe Brady comes in as the offensive coordinator replaces Ken Dorsey this was a change that actually happened mid-season of last year so we do have some data on this we saw a greater commitment to the running game pass rate over expected went from fifth to 25th once Joe Brady took over this offense maybe we see a greater commitment to James Cook uh, with passing game weapons um, you know not really to be located without Stefan Diggs and Gabriel Davis maybe James Cook is a guy that takes a big step forward just as a back in general on the ground as well as how many targets he's getting or maybe Ray Davis is going to be the guy that they run the early down offense through and maybe the goal line offense through he's obviously a guy that has maybe a standalone role plus handcuff upside Brady's number one receiver most of his sample with Carolina and as well as with his sample last year when he took over the play calling indicates that this is a spread the ball out system if you look at Carolina days with DJ Moore Um, And last year with Stefan Diggs as the season went along. And even in 2019, when he orchestrated the best college football offense in history with LSU having Clyde Edwards-Hilaire and uh, Jamar Chase and Justin Jefferson and Terrace Marshall and Thaddeus Moss, that offense was very widespread, spread out. It wasn't just Jefferson and Chase, who, of course, we know are superstars in the NFL. It could have been, but it wasn't. They actually spread the ball out quite a bit. So it's possible that this whole Curtis Samuel, Khalil Shakir, Keon Coleman, Dalton Kincaid, James Cook is actually good for the Buffalo Bills offense. They don't need to feed Stefan Diggs. They don't need to feed a number one guy. Curtis Samuel, for what it's worth, has played in this offense before. He was wide receiver 23 the last time he was with Joe Brady, and he actually finished ahead of DJ Moore that year in points per game. So, I mean, these guys are weird, man. I have a weird sense of this whole Buffalo Bills offense. I don't have any definitive takes that one of these guys is a value or one of these guys is a fade. I actually think that all of them are solidly priced, and I make an effort to take all of Curtis Samuel, Keon Coleman, 
Khalil Shakir, James Cook, and Dalton Kincaid. None of these guys really stand out to me as a guy that I absolutely have to have or a guy that I'm absolutely fading. Shakir right now, I believe, is my highest rostered player from this team, but that's only because he's the cheapest, and I believe this is going to be a spread-the-ball-out type of scheme, like I said. So Khalil Shakir is the guy that I guess I'm most in on, but Kincaid, Cook, Coleman, um, Curtis Samuel, all these guys have places on certain builds that I run through. Like if I'm really wide receiver heavy early and it's round five, like I'll take James Cook. If I have Josh Allen already, I'll take Dalton Kincaid on the next turn. Like there's there's times and places for all of these players. I think the offense will be good, but I'm not exactly sure how good. Stock up for me on Dalton Kincaid because of the pass catching weapons leaving. Stock up for me on Curtis Samuel and Ray Davis as well. And then probably stock neutral on the rest of the guys, Allen Cook, Coleman, and Khalil Shakir. So let's head over to the Pittsburgh Steelers where everybody's favorite clown, Arthur Smith, is now in charge of the offense. They are taking over for Matt Canada as the offensive coordinator. Every fantasy football player knows exactly what this guy's thinking. He wants to pound the rock. He wants to run the football, right? The Steelers damn near spent every pick they had in the draft on an offensive lineman, it felt like. They they drafted Roman Wilson in the, in the third round, but they pretty much spent every other draft pick they had on offensive line help. Najee and Warren go very closely in underdog drafts right now, round seven-ish, round eight. Around that seven, eight turn is where they're going. But in home leagues, I could see people pushing Najee up the board and letting Warren fall because Najee has traditionally been the guy that's gone higher in fantasy drafts. He, of course, was a first-round pick a couple of years ago in fantasy drafts. If he's way more expensive in home leagues, definitely opt for Jalen Warren. But on underdog, they're closely priced enough that I actually take both of them. As for the passing weapons in this offense, Arthur Smith, before he was a dictator in Atlanta and, and ruined Drake London and Kyle Pitts, he was actually a very respectable OC in Tennessee, where A.J. Brown had great years under him. Um, They had other options. Corey Davis had a good year under him as well. Arthur Smith's Titans and Falcons, yes, led the NFL in rush rate during his tenure. So they're not going to be a run heavy or a pass heavy offense at all. In fact, they'll probably be one of the most run heavy offenses in the league. But he took Ryan Tannehill from a cast aside quarterback into like literally a top five guy by every metric when he was the offensive coordinator in Tennessee. So maybe Russell Wilson being told to rein it in get back to what made him successful in Seattle will actually make him play a lot better. And it's possible the Steelers offense does the Mike Tomlin thing where they win just enough games that nobody gets fired and they win nine games and it's a good enough offense. George Pickens is alone in that wide receiver core. And for me, I feel like he could command a big time target share, but the Steelers might not throw that much, right? Like I said, it's possible that George Pickens can be great from an advanced metric standpoint be a 30% target share guy, but only finish like wide receiver 29 because he doesn't have enough pass volume to kind of sustain that type of uh, finish where you want him to be a top 15 or a top 12 dude where you're drafting him. Pat Fryermuth is actually my most drafted player from this team because the Falcons tight ends, believe it or not, when you add them all up, Jonu Smith, Kyle Pitts, and all the guys, they led all tight end cores around the NFL in receiving yardage. So Yes, I'm aware that Kyle Pitts ruined, uh, got ruined by Arthur Smith and completely trolled by him for his entire career. But what if Pat Fryermuth, because he's like in a traditional inline tight end, is the guy that you need this year at the tight end position to really pay off at ADP? When you talk about tight end breakouts, it usually comes when they're the number one or the number two of their offense. And I feel pretty confident saying that Pat Fryermuth is the second best target earner on this offense behind Pickens. So it's possible that he could really hit big as a, you know, 11th, 12th round pick where you're getting him and potentially give you a top six season at the tight end position. I feel he's one of the very few tight ends that I actually feel confident going in the late rounds that I can get a really good value on. So Fryermuth is a guy that I've been heavily targeting. Now let's move on to two kind of less interesting offensive coordinator changes. We have the Chicago Bears where Shane Waldron comes in to replace Luke Getze. Luke Getze wasn't good in off- as offensive coordinator of the Chicago Bears, but will Shane Waldron be any better is really my question. I am not optimistic about Shane Waldron because in his lone season, as the head honcho in Seattle, everybody disappointed. Metcalf, Lockett, JSN, Geno, everybody disappointed in that offense last year without Dave Canales there, who obviously was with him before that, and without Sean McVay when um, Shane Waldron was in the Rams scheme, he didn't really perform at a level that you feel comfortable about him commanding an offense, and he's going to be asked to do that in Chicago because they have a defensive head coach. All three of wide receivers in Seattle failed to return ADP, Maybe that's foreshadowing for the Chicago Bears wide receivers because, of course, they have Romo Dunze, DJ Moore, and Keenan Allen, plus a superstar young quarterback that might be 
the type of guy that has growing pains because he's really young and he's a rookie. So I'm a little concerned that Shane Waldron is the reason that the Bears could disappoint. I think that the Bears, generally speaking, are a great offense to target, but the one caveat I have for that is what if Shane Waldron ruins this thing? Hopefully, Caleb Williams is just so good that it doesn't matter, but it's possible that he gets his development stunted, and it also doesn't speak well on Shane Waldron that Jackson Smith and Jigba basically shit-talked him on a radio show and said, good luck to y'all to the Chicago Bears when they hired him because he doesn't feel, I guess, that he was used properly in Seattle, and he definitely wasn't when you look at the advanced metrics. So I tend to think that Caleb will be able to carry this thing, but it's possible that the Bears kind of disappoint. I would say stock neutral on the run game. I don't think it really matters for DeAndre Swift and Khalil Herbert and uh, Roshan Johnson. I think Swift will probably be the lead back, but it won't be a significant uh, touch advantage over the rest of the guys. Stock slightly down to me on the passing game. So Closing out this video, the final coaching change that we got to talk about is the aforementioned Luke Getze now going to the Las Vegas Raiders, replacing uh, the coordinators that they had there. This offense may be one of the worst in the NFL if it all goes wrong. I, I think there's a doomsday scenario for the Raiders where they have the first overall pick in next year's draft because their quarterback situation, in my opinion, is probably the worst in the league. Getze's a Matt LaFleur disciple in Green Bay, but it's hard to know how much in Chicago he was actually doing because... Matt Eberflus maybe wanted to run the ball a lot and Justin Fields wasn't really a capable quarterback and that's why maybe they were a run-heavy team. But regardless, I think everything points to the fact that it's probably good news for Zamir White because Matt LaFleur's scheme where he comes from is a very run-heavy scheme and in Chicago, he was a very run-heavy coach. Alexander Madison, I mean, head coach Antonio Pierce said he was a depth signing and Seventh round rookie Dylan Lauby, interesting dart throw, but probably not going to contribute much on the ground, maybe in, as a pass catcher. There's a very good chance that we see Zamir White run the ball 250 plus times this year, and potentially more than that, and he could have a thousand yards and eight touchdowns on the ground, even if this offense isn't good. So Zamir White, where he's going on underdog, I've made it an effort to take him more. In home leagues, I feel like he's a very typical dead zone running back who will go in like round four, round five, and I won't be willing to draft him there over the wide receivers that are going in that range. But on underdog specifically, I do think he's a half decent value. Devontae Adams and Brock Bowers, of course, are the priciest options in this offense. Even Devontae Adams, uh, who's been probably a Hall of Fame caliber wide receiver, is not immune to this situation. I do think there's a world where Devontae Adams is good and can command targets and all that kind of stuff, but he disappoints relative to his 19th overall ADP. That tends to lead me away from Devontae Adams because it's just so much harder to click the button on aging wide receiver, bad potential offense, run heavy potential offense with bad quarterback play when there's young, upside, talented receivers in great offenses going right near him. It's really hard to click the button on Devontae Adams with all of those surrounding factors. And I think if anybody can do it, it could be Adams. He's that talented of a dude. But what if he's over the hill? What if he's lost a step? It's very possible that he very much disappoints at his current ADP. Brock Bowers, of all the players in this offense, is the one that I have been targeting the most because Cole Komet led the Bears in targets in 2022 under Luke Getze. And even though DJ Moore was brought in last year, he still finished tight end nine in points per game. So I'm not exactly sure how Michael Mayer will factor into the you know, snap share usage. And I'm sure we'll get insights onto that in preseason games. But for me, I just think Brock Bowers is that good. And he's that big of an upside swing that I'm willing to take the shot on him, even if the offense is bad, even if I don't really believe in Gardner Minshew slash Aiden O'Connell or Luke Getze as the offensive coordinator. I think Brock Bowers could just be that dude. So that's why I've been drafting him. But regardless, I would say it's probably stock down in general on the entire Las Vegas Raiders offense from last year, because Jimmy Garoppolo at least was a veteran quarterback who could kind of, you know, command the ship. This year, I do think it's going to be a ragtag group of misfits and a run-heavy offense all the way to the top five NFL draft pick and their future quarterback in the 2025 draft. So that is the end of this video. It was a lot of stuff that I talked about. Leave me down below any of your big takeaways from this video. What do you think is the most interesting coaching change that happened? For me, I would say if I had to rank them in terms of like interesting coaching changes, obviously the Atlanta Falcons are low-hanging fruit. I think the Tennessee Titans are one of the most underrated. And I really do like some of the value tight end options that some of these coaching changes could provide us. Like I said, with Pat Fryermuth and Jatavian Sanders and Noah Fant and those type of guys, I think that's how you find those late round tight ends is by looking at some of these schematic and coaching changes. So um, yeah, leave any likes, comments, subscribe to the channel if you guys are new. Of course, like I said, I will post this as an article to the site if you want to read all of the notes that I have, all the stats that I have here. 
That'll be available on flockfantasy.com. Promo code FSE for 30% off, seven days for free when you sign up there. And of course, if you sign up annually, you get a free team review. We can break down one of your dynasty teams and kind of go through all of your moves, rebuilding, contending, just like we do on Dynasty Decisions, only that'll be a personal video that I send to you guys or Danny sends to you guys when we do that. So if that interests you, link will be down below for that in the description. And of course, I did make reference to the fact that Scott Barrett of Fantasy Points posted an article that really inspired me to do this video on the NFL coaching changes. And I will link that down below in the description as well, because he, like I said, was the inspiration for this. And I want to give him definitely some credit and fantasy points puts out great content. Like I said, not a sponsor, just promoting uh, what I think to be very good work. So with that being said, peace out and we'll talk to you soon.